specialist in the state of Georgia. He trained many of us to practice medicine in his 40 to 50 years of service at Grady Memorial Hospital and Emory University School of Medicine. And Tuck was a fighter pilot in World War II along with his father who was in the Army in the Pacific and had the unique experience of spending the night with his father during the, during the uh, Pacific campaign on Guam Island after it was secured. And we're going to let Tuck just talk a little bit about himself and see where he takes us from there. Tuck, I'm going to start off by asking you, you graduated from North Fulton High School in 1938. What was the tone of the country at that time? Well, it was very optimistic. Uh, things were, had not quite yet uh, begun with uh, uh, Hitler's invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland. So in 1938, uh, we went off to college, and uh, uh, we, it was a very hopeful and uh, happy time. But Atlanta was idyllic uh, during the years I was at North Fulton High School. Uh, we grew up here. We were not part of the uh, of the uh, real Buckhead boys out uh, in the uh, northern part of the town, but we lived right inside of. Uh, the county uh, had Bookwood Hills, and uh, my father had built a house there in 1925, and so uh, I went to North Full to uh, E River School, uh, just about the time E Rivers uh, opened up, and Mrs. Osterhout was the uh, the principal at that time, and graduated from uh, E Rivers, and then went to North Fulton four years there and was uh, then uh, qualified to go to college after 11 years of high school, whereas most of the other places in the country, they, it took uh, 12 years to get through schooling. Did you go to Princeton? Yes. Uh, my cousin, uh, Mac Asbill, uh, uh, lived with me in uh, Brookwood Hills, and we went to North Fulton together. He was the president of our class. And uh, I think I edited the uh, annual or something. But uh, we went to Princeton together and uh, uh, roomed together at, at four years of Princeton and graduated just at the time World War II uh, broke out. World War II began uh, on December 7th of 41, and we graduated in uh, May of 42 and went immediately into the service. Where were you on December 7, 1941? Well, I was riding in an automobile in the hills just west of Princeton and southern New Jersey, in central New Jersey there. Beautiful afternoon, and over the radio came the word that uh, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor had been executed. So uh, from then on, uh, uh, in the college dormitories, in the, in, the, in the yards around the dormitories, they had bonfires that night and everybody was, there, there was no uh, question about uh, patriotism or loyalty or readiness to volunteer and go. It was uh, just a time when it seemed like there could be no question, but that that's which we had to go. Were you in ROTC at that time? No, I was not in ROTC. So you went on and graduated and joined the military? Yes. Uh, uh, I think because of the fact that my father had already been called to active duty in the National Guard, I had uh, made application for uh, naval flight training uh, back in October, the fall before the actual war uh, was declared. Uh, but they uh, let me go to the University of Georgia for pre-flight training uh, in uh, June uh, when I graduated from college. So they let us get, finish our degree. But I had, I wasn't in the ROTC, but I had enlisted uh, in the Navy for flight training. How long did flight training last and all that before you were ready? Well, it was, a, it was a complicated path. It went through the uh, uh, flying the old biplane, uh, uh, biplanes uh, right down where the airport is now at Dallas uh, and uh, at Grand Prairie. And uh, then we went from there to Corpus Christi and uh, did uh, single engine uh, training, solo flight. And uh, then after graduation from there, 
still in the Navy, we were allowed to choose Marine Corps or Navy for long-term uh, uh, enlistment. And uh, so uh, because the Marines had, uh, were doing so well in Guadalcanal and they were fighting in, on the islands in the Pacific, I said, well, I'll, I'll go with the Marines. So I transferred from the Navy to the Marines and uh, got my torpedo bomber training, uh, the same plane that uh, George H.W. Bush uh, crashed in, uh, has been on the television recently. Uh, I flew the torpedo bombers, uh, TBMs and the TBFs, uh, and uh, um, Fort Lauderdale, and then overseas thereafter. When did you go overseas? Well, I went overseas in January of uh, 43, and uh, we went on a, one of the small uh, aircraft carriers after we checked out to land on the carrier, but I never did that in combat, but we were on a CP, uh, aircraft carrier that went to uh, the the Solomon Island. Well, we went to New Guinea and uh, into the uh, Espiritu Santo, where tales from the South Pacific came from. I used to know Bloody Mary down there <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the island of Espiritu Santo. Uh, and it was true that uh, she had a daughter on an island over across the water there. If you remember the uh, songs and the dances in uh, Tales of the South Pacific, but it really was like that. It was, it was, it was not torture. It was idyllic. It was beautiful country, and we say flew through the islands and all that kind of thing. But then went from there up to uh, the Solomon Islands in Bougainville, uh, which uh, was uh, just partially secured at the time, and out of Bougainville flew some. Uh, glad bombing missions up to Rabaul, uh, New Britain, and uh, got a little aircraft, anti-aircraft flak, and uh, a few scars on the plane, but nobody got hurt. So uh, from there, my whole squadron flew all the way around the Pacific uh, through the uh, Samoa and up to the Kwajalein and and in we talk and, and out to the Marianas Islands, which had just been secured, and we were stationed on Tinian there. Now that's a, just a, an hour's flight north of Guam. Uh, Guam was still under siege, and my father was uh, there up in the hills uh, doing the, some of the uh, land fighting. Uh, in his artillery uh, battalion uh, that he commanded uh, in a foxhole up in Guam. And uh, I flew down there one day, landed at the military strip, and uh, got a hold of him and put him in the back of my plane and uh, flew him up to Tinian for over a weekend because things were quiet on the island at the time. And uh, he was scared of flying in the back of that plane with me than he was sitting in the foxhole on Guam. But uh, we, had a, we had a good visit together, and uh, then he went back, and his career was uh, really dramatic. After Guam was secured, they went down to northern Australia, and then up fought the Battle of Lady Gulf, or east uh, on the west of Mindanao in the Philippines, uh, did amphibious landing there. And after securing that, uh, they came up to uh, uh, Okinawa. Uh, my father was uh, clo very close to my first cousin from Atlanta here named Lecky Maddox, who lived out on uh, uh, Petrie Battle Avenue. Uh, he and Lecky had been in the National Guard together, and uh, Lecky was killed uh, by the Japanese on Okinawa. My father was on a small island adjacent to that when he got wounded when they came down the hill and threw uh, hand grenades in his foxhole and jumped in and he fought them off. And, but he was wounded some. Uh, I had already been dispatched up to Iwo Jima with a detachment of six of our planes 
to uh, fly the uh, patrol around the island up there to keep the uh, submarines from coming in and, and uh, sinking all of our supply ships and that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, I had been at Iwo Jima uh, with my little detachment. And they told me it was time for me to come back to the States. And I said, well, I can't do that with my father sitting out here on, uh, in uh, Okinawa. And so uh, I continued to uh, uh, have the uh, patrols around uh, Iwo Jima for uh, a few months after that. And uh, I guess that was maybe April uh, of 45. And in uh, June, I got word that he had been wounded on the Okinawa of the little island of Iwo and uh, we, uh, he came back. He was on Guam being evacuated back to the States. I said, okay, I'm ready to come back. So uh, I got my flight back, and uh, we both landed uh, in the States on the 4th of July, 1945, thinking that we'd have to go back over if we had to leave. Uh, and on August 15th, they dropped the uh, A-bomb, and uh, so the war was over after that. How many combat missions do you think you flew? Do you recall? No, I, I only I only flew a half a dozen combat missions over Rabaul. The rest of mine, it turned out uh, to, that the land-based uh, torpedo bombers uh, flew patrol all around all of the islands of the Pacific we, we were occupying to uh, drop what they call sonar buoys to pick up the sounds of Japanese submarines. And if you picked up the sound, then you deployed uh, around the area where the sound was picked up and dropped depth charges to uh, sink the, the submarines or to drive them off. So we were flying in a submarine patrol and watching for surface craft and things like that. Uh, most of the time in the South Pacific uh, and uh, around Iwo Jima. But we did a few another a half a dozen uh, control where we went in with the glide bombs and and let the bombs release to go into the caves that were on the side of the mountains there at Iwo Jima. And there was rifle fire coming back and machine gun fire, but no very heavy anti-aircraft fire. Counsel me if they're shooting at me. <laughs> so, can you tell me something more about your daddy's injury? I know he was deafened at the pup tent. Encounters. Yeah. Don't read one time. Don't worry about having a face-to-face -face encounter with a Japanese soldier. Yeah, the guy junk came down and jumped in his foxhole, and and uh, uh, he had a he had a long pole stick of some sort, and he was jabbing it at my father, who had been in his in his sleeping bag in the in the foxhole, was calling out, and this guy was jabbing him with the pole gave him a hernia that he had to get fixed out of the VA hospital here in Atlanta when he came back. But uh, one of his, uh, one of his uh, uh, detachment there the, uh, in his artillery regiment, they jumped in behind the Jap and collared him and dragged him out. And I think uh, he was killed. But uh, it was, uh, that was the closest came to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, he described it quite vividly to me. He told me that he, there was an explosion somewhere during this encounter. That was the the, the, the uh, <clears throat> grenade that went in the t in the little edge of the of the foxhole. They have a little rim, so the rainwater doesn't come down, and the grenade caught in this little rim up around the foxhole and exploded upward. Otherwise, it would have killed him dead if it had fallen down in the bottom of the foxhole. Close encounters are the strangest kind. Yeah. So where were you doing Jimmy Doolittle's raid on Tokyo in 1942, I think it's when it was? Well, it was uh, 42 or 43. I, I was uh, probably still in training at that time. Uh, the uh, event in the war that influenced me the most, made me choose torpedo bombers, was uh, the fact that uh, the old original torpedo bombers were responsible for sinking the Japanese ships at the Battle of Midway. And that was the turning point in the war. In other words, uh, 
uh, from that point on, the American dominance was uh, growing larger, and uh, no question we were going to win the war in the Pacific. After the Japanese uh, uh, large battleships and cruisers were sunk at the Battle of Midway, but uh, the torpedo bombers, which just all flew together right over the uh, bow of these uh, ships that were coming down the road, with the guys just shooting at them point blank as they dropped the torpedoes, uh, that seemed to me to be the. Uh, uh, Maybe you might call it the most heroic uh, uh, kind of uh, warfare, the, the most uh, effective dollar for dollar that you could do. So uh, that was why I thought that the torpedo bombs rather than the fighter planes would be my choice in the Air Force. Where did you meet your wife? That was after the war when I was a medical student uh, at Harvard. Uh, she was uh, a nurse at Children's Hospital in, uh, in Boston and, uh, in fact, was my instructor as I was a medical student talking about how you took care of newborn babies. So uh, I met her there at that time and uh, uh, learned her story, her war story, uh, uh, from her uh, after we were married after that. What was her war story? Well, before the World War II, the nursing profession was mostly nursing aides, and, and the, the formal requirements for medical education and technical training were not very well specified. But there was such a shortage of nurses in the early World War II that the uh, uh, public health service decided to start a nurses' training program. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, they called it the Cadet Nurse Corps. And my wife was in the first class of those. Turn it around. Turn it well, this is a little cartoon that shows the story. This is President Roosevelt signing the bill. And uh, they uh, uh, required that the candidates for training graduate from college first and then uh, go into their nurses' training. But it was a very demanding, very uh, compacted uh, period of technical training. And in fact, they were left uh, taking care of the people in the hospitals in Boston, for instance, uh, with no interns or uh, residents in the hospital because they'd all been called into the military service. So they had a tremendous amount of responsibility, did a wonderful job, and learned a great deal during that period of time. And then they uh, graduated and uh, went to the military service. Now, she never was in any combat service, but she was in this first training group. And uh, it's interesting that uh, during the course of uh, the years when this was active, they trained 124,000 nurses. Uh, and uh, uh, from that time on, nursing has become a profession with specific requirements and criteria for graduation and for certification. And so uh, I thought she was as much a veteran of the war as uh, I was. Why don't you show us a picture of your wife and her uniform? This is a, uh, yes, this is a picture of Jenny when uh, she uh, graduated uh, from uh, cadet nursing and uh, went back for a little uh, leave visit in Wausau, Wisconsin, which was where she originally came from. And show us a picture of yourself and your uniform. Well, this, uh, this was after I had uh, completed my training for the torpedo bombers. And as I said, this was the same plane that uh, George Bush uh, flew, and I had two uh, crewmen, a tail gunner and a turret gunner. And it was in the turret gunner's place where I flew my father up from Guam. But uh, that, that was, uh, it was, it was a clunky old airplane, a pretty big one, and we carried 2,000 pounds of bomb or torpedo. But it wasn't the kind of thing that you flew in uh, 
uh, loops and uh, and did uh, combat air fight fighting with. But my other hero during the World War II who lived with me in Brookwood Hills and grew up with me was my first cousin, Mac Asbill. And uh, Mac uh, was the president of our uh, graduating class at North Fulton uh, in 1938. And uh, when we graduated from Princeton, he joined the Ground Marine Corps. And uh, after finishing his training, he became the aide to General H.M. Smith, Howland Mad Smith, who commanded uh, all the Marines in the island to island fighting in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, Mac was his, uh, his uh, aide, uh, his, really his right hand man. I, I met with them. Uh, in Honolulu at one time while we were overseas, but uh, Mac uh, had a very responsible job there and uh, later uh, went on to practice law uh, in Sutherland, Asbel and Brennan, uh, the firm that had originally been Sutherland, Tuttle and Brennan, uh, but my father left when he uh, joined uh, the Eisenhower's government as a general counsel to the Treasury Department. But uh, Mac, uh, uh, Mac's father uh, added his name to the firm, leaving my uncle Bill Sutherland and uh, my uh, uncle Mac Asbill uh, in the practice together, which still is uh, here in Atlanta. But uh, Mac was practicing law in Washington, D.C., and was the president of the Chamber of Commerce there. And had he not died of cancer in the early 80s, I think Washington, D.C. would be a different city today as a result of what he would have done, because he was a great public servant, too. I think your father and yourself have both been great public servants in my lifetime that I've known. It's been a pleasure to know you both. Would you mind talking a little bit about this article that your father wrote in 1957? And reading us selected excerpts that you think exemplify what he stood for? Well, Emory University gave a, a graduate, an honorary degree to my father uh, after he was on the Federal Circuit Court here in Atlanta. And uh, they asked him to give a graduation uh, talk uh, at a graduation of uh, lawyers doctors and ministers uh, from the theology school. And uh, he recalled the heroes that had come to his attention, uh, both in English history and uh, uh, in uh, American history, and spoke some of their heroism. And also of the guy, of the Chinese guy who drove his Jeep in combat in the Pacific. And uh, he told his Chinese driver that he didn't want him driving up to the front lines because he might be mistaken for Japanese. And uh, Nan Chu said, I go anyway. And he told him, no, I tell you, I command you to remain here. He said, Colonel, I go. And he got in the Jeep and he started driving. So that was one of his heroes. But at the end of his talk here, since he was, uh, uh, after referring to John Wesley and uh, to uh, the uh, English lawyer Erskine, he, uh, he said uh, that he thought he had something to say to the new graduates that were just uh, getting their degrees in the professions. And he said, in a brief moment, we have considered the nature of heroism. We have mentioned some of its exemplars. We have pointed out some areas where its inspiring force is needed. Is there anything more that needs to be said on the relationship of heroism to the professions? I think there is. The professional man is, in essence, one who provides service. But the service he renders is something more than that of the laborer, even the skilled laborer. It is a service that wells up from the entire complex of his personality. True, some specialized and highly developed techniques may be included, but their mode of expression is given its deepest meaning by the personality of the practitioner. 
In a very real sense, his professional service cannot be separate from his personal being. He has no goods to sell, no land to till. His only asset is himself. It turns out that there is no right price for service, for what is a share of a man worth? If he does not contain the quality of integrity, he is worthless. If he does, he is priceless. The value is either nothing or it is infinite. So do not try to set a price on yourselves. Do not measure out your professional services on an apothecary scale and say only this for so much. Do not debase yourselves by equating your souls to what they will bring in the market. Do not be a miser, hoarding your talents and abilities and knowledge, either among yourselves or in your dealings with your clients, patients, students, or parishioners. Rather be reckless and spendthrift, pouring out your talent to all to whom it can be of service. Throw it away, waste it, and in the spending, it will be increased. Do not keep a watchful eye lest you slip and give away a little of what you might have sold. Do not censor your thoughts to gain a wider audience. Like love, talent is only useful in its expenditure, and it is never exhausted. Certain it is that man must eat, so set what price you must on your service. But never confuse the performance, which is great, with the compensation, be it money, power, or fame, which is trivial. The important thing is that in a society of little men, you have the opportunity to be a hero. The job is there, you will see it. Your strength is such as you graduate from memory that you need not consider what the task will cost you. It's not enough that you do your duty. The richness of life lies in the performance, which is above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, well, I can't think of a family that's exemplified those strengths more than yours. Well, he was the inspiration, and uh, we've, uh, we've all uh, been proud of being his family. Well, we're proud of being a friend of yours also. So yeah. We think you're just as important as he was to everybody in the legal sense you have been in the medical sense. What do you think about families having multiple family members in the service like you all had back in World War II and like we saw last week on television where a family of three or four boys were going to go overseas to Iraq? Well, uh, it depends on it depends on what the situation is. I don't think that abstractly a family ought to make itself vulnerable to decimation by sending everybody to the battlefront. In World War II, this was the last war that was so unequivocal in the fact that it had to be done that there was no doubt, and my mother sent us all off. Uh, we, uh, uh, she got a little place to live down at the George and Terry's Hotel, and every day waited for the mail to see how we were doing and hoping things were going to be all right. Uh, but I think even she did not consider this to be uh, an inordinate uh, sacrifice or risk to run because she knew that we all were fully committed and dedicated and there was no question in anybody's mind that that was where we ought to be. So uh, I think uh, there are people who are left alone as a result of warfare and uh, if you've only got one son, you send him away. Well. We have to do that uh, if uh, he decides in his own mind that he wants to enlist. And so uh, nowadays we're not uh, drafting them, but we are enlisting them. And those who see the value of their patriotism as a member in the combat areas, uh, they are the ones who enlist. So I think it's a matter of personal uh, commitment and uh, conviction that uh, this is the thing that you need to be.
Your father was about as strong a proponent as peaceful resolution to ideologic differences and cultural interactions as anybody in the history of the United States. Do you think there will be a time in the world where we'll be able to get the different ideologies together on one bargaining table where we can settle our differences with law books as opposed to bullets? No, it's to be honest with you, he was not he was not an angry man or a uh, a born combatant. He he did the combat duty as his obligation, but uh, in actual fact, uh, he was very and, and in spite of the fact that he uh, was. Initially, uh, uh, he was a Republican appointee of uh, uh, General of uh, President Eisenhower to the court, as well as uh, the counsel for the Treasury Department. But he was not a uh, uh, street fighter, and in fact, during the civil rights uh, period, was a great supporter of the civil rights movement and uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, and uh, used his position on the court to uh, uh, try to allow them to express their uh, beliefs and exert their uh, energy in a way that was uh, a non-combatant way. And I wrote in the uh, Memorial Day Parade in uh, Washington, D.C., in an old Model A Ford with my son-in-law a couple of weeks, uh, last month, uh, at the Memorial Day in Washington. And uh, one of the television interviewers grabbed a hold of me and said, what do you think? And I said, well, uh, World War II was the last time that we could unequivocally all say this is what we ought to do. There, there have been pros and cons uh, ever since, and uh, I personally think that the heroes of the 20th century are Mohandas Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King, and our South African uh, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Uh, as uh, the people who have been the most heroic in their approach to nonviolence. Uh, and uh, King and uh, King and Gandhi died as a result of violence, but uh, they never took up arms themselves. And I think my father was really basically a peaceful man. Well, I think he was very much a peaceful man. Uh, that's why my question is whether or not you think that in future generations we'll have more peacemakers than we will have troublemakers. I pray that would be the case. If you had to choose the most important lesson you got out of World War II of growing up in that era, what, what or lessons, what, what would they be? Well, I decided in, while I was overseas in World War II that I preferred not to come back and go to law school, which I had already planned to do in graduating from Princeton, because I was never very great at the literal word and the uh, dollars and the, the, the figures and the numbers that went into the kind of tax law that uh, my father's firm did. I said, I want to do something else. And when I came back, I took one of these aptitude tests, and they said, well, you are pretty good at solving problems. So I said, well, medicine offers the greatest opportunity to solve the problems, and so uh, I think I'll go into medicine. So uh, out of World War II came my uh, switch to profession from law to medicine. And after being uh, so, having such generous support from uh, the Bill of Rights, I mean the uh, servicemen's uh, benefits and things like that, to go to medical school, 
I said, I want to come back to Atlanta and work at uh, Grady Hospital uh, for my career as uh, uh, to give service back to the community for all that I've gotten out of all of this. So the war itself uh, was really a growth experience for me rather than uh, than uh, something that left me uh, hopeless and uh, without uh, faith in, in humanity. Were you ever scared in the war? <laughs> oh, the whole time I was scared in my own damn fault. Uh, we were flying around, uh, squadron all around the uh, Pacific and uh, on the island of Inuitok, I was late getting to the flight line to take off to fly along the B, the the uh, uh, transport plane that we were flying wing on as we went thousands of miles across the water. Uh, I ran out, jumped in my plane, and I was so late to get into the squadron and get off that I didn't put my parachute on. Well. Halfway, 500 miles out at sea, we ran into a great big front with thunderheads and clouds and lightning and everything going on. And we flew into this totally dense cloud formation, not being able to see each other five feet between the wings. And uh, but we just kept on flying and trying to keep as level and as straight as we could. And uh, when we came out of the front on the other side. I looked around, I didn't see any of my buddies on either side of me, and I called my gunner in the back, and I said, uh, Bill, where'd those other guys go? He said, Lord, Lieutenant, you didn't see that guy that flew by about five feet under our tail. If, if that guy clipped off my tail in the middle of those clouds, me and no parachute, I'd have been down dead in the sea. So that was probably the most... Uh, the highest risk I came to, they having any kind of a bad outcome. That's not oh, because I left, <laughs> oh, because I left my parachute on. We've got a few more minutes. Is there anything you'd like to be remembered for in terms of your World War II experience of your fathers or families that you'd like to say to future generations? Um, well, I think that we, we need to look carefully with uh, the morals and the ethics that we grow up with to try to understand who we are and what we can do with our lives that is constructive. There are some people who seem to just spend their whole time tearing things down and, and uh, being in opposition to one thing or another and to uh, uh, acting in a way that uh, creates chaos instead of order. Now, there are many different ways in which you can contribute to order and uh, fitting together this whole network of humanity. And if the, if the quilt that you're knitting together gets frayed, you got to sew up the connections between the little squares. You got to make your own square as good as you can and uh, not be in the situation of trying to rip it apart, tear it apart. And this way you build a connection between your square on the quilt of life over here and the people in India and China. So I think now that I'm coming to feel that I'm not an American, but a citizen of the world. And I, I want to see us uh, look at the total benefit from the world standpoint, ecologically or culturally, uh, economically, to try to do the things that are going to make us most productive as the citizens of the whole world these days instead of it's it's so amazing that with communication uh, moving the way it does that we are far closer to the people in india and china and africa and europe today 
than the people in Massachusetts were to the people of Georgia when the United States was formed. I mean, you, you had no idea about these people when we were formed together. And nowadays, we are in communication all the time. We know CNN tells us what's going on. The telephones will let us talk to our friends in Italy. It's a, it's, uh, the world is, is now a family, whereas your farm was about all you could relate to uh, back when this country was formed. So the technological changes have created a whole different atmosphere in the world as a whole. Well, I think you were taught by a master. <laughs> I think so. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. Dr. Tuttle, it's an honor and a privilege to interview you. As I stated earlier, you were one of my professors and did my internship and residency and got me interested in kidney disease and you've inspired me and you've inspired many other people the same way you did, he inspired lots of people. So our generation is forever in your debt. Well, it's been a pleasure and a wonderful life, I tell you. I think that's it. I don't know how to turn this off, so they'll yeah, that's turn it right. off for us. The, uh, let's see, let's figure out this. Stop. <coughs> well, it's, uh... I'm going to let them cut that off, because I don't want to lose anything. All right. Cut it off. Right. One of the interesting things about the medicine business was that uh, I'd been, I came here in 1956, and in uh, 1958 I got a call from Aylston Hospital that they had a little kid out there with uh, childhood nephrosis, infantile nephrosis. There were no pediatric nephrologists at the time. I went out and saw this guy. His name was Ricky Cassell. Well, I followed Ricky all during his childhood and his adolescence. Uh, he finally developed renal failure in 73. He was a Jehovah's Witness, and I got permission from the church to do a kidney transplant, even though we had to agree <coughs> we wouldn't transfuse him uh, during the process. So we got that done. It lasted about a year. He bled down uh, with his recurrent uremia to a hematocrit of five. It was the lowest hematocrit I ever saw. His blood didn't even look like blood hardly. <laughs> but he stopped bleeding, and <coughs> then along came the EPO and stuff like that. So we pulled him out of it. He's been on peritoneal dialysis now since then. He's now as old as my kids. He's still on peritoneal dialysis down in Stockbridge, Georgia. Uh, we are now trying to get him a, another transplant. Uh, my kids used to say, Daddy, you care more about Ricky than you do about us. <laughs> but, but he's really like my kid. And I've been following him since 58 now, so that, that's 40. Uh, Isn't that amazing? You never thought when we were coming along. I didn't think people would live that long with kidney failure. Well, but you one of the pioneers. I've there. got a bunch of them that uh, have lived that long. But the, the amusing thing was that, that the phone would ring and I, they'd say, "Ricky's calling." <laughs> but I been, was lucky to be able to bring him along this well. The uh, you know, well, I don't want to mention names over. It's been recorded still. And we get it. I've got any number of people who you know, had three and four kidney transplants yeah. in their lifetime. They live pretty normal lives. They do extremely Yeah, well, I talk to Liz every once in a while. I don't, I'm not sure that you knew her. Uh, uh, Rusa. Rusa? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, uh, I took care of her through you a couple care, of her transplants. You take care, care of everybody through something, <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. I she, think that's all we need to do, except I've got to get Frances and see if she can get us. All right. Got John Ridley coming in here to interview. Oh, good. Here he is. Oh, you got Peggy to come, too. Oh, I owe you a big apology. 
You know what I mean? Well, if you look, I'm so glad you got the pretty one in the family. Oh, it's, yeah, we brought it. I've turned off the audio, but the video thing is still going on. Hello, Ben. Hey, I'm glad to see you. How are you? Hey, you know Albert Tuttle. Don't you know Pat hey. Ridley? Hello, nice good to see, see you. Hey, Ridley. Got a hand over there. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. You want us in here? You, I'm just an interloper. Would you sit, would, don't you want to sit next time? <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> where, where do you want me to sit? You sit over there and I'll pull Peggy's chair around. Francis has got to tell Tuck right, what to do now with all of his goodies that he brought.